again, we thank you for showing up here in Charleston for the Savannah Riverside Citizens Advisory Board. Uh, we will begin with the chair's update. Um, the chairperson, Mrs. Nina Spinelli, has another engagement, so she's uh, disposed at this time. So I'll be giving the update. Public comments, uh, board meetings open to the public. Public comment periods provided at every meeting. Public uh, can also email comments to SRS Citizens Advisory Board at srs.gov. Uh, monitoring began in Georgia. Researchers started an environmental monitoring program in Georgia community of Shell Bluff, south of Augusta on the Savannah River near the nuclear power plant and a federal nuclear facility. Some residents are worried about the potential for contamination. Um, next meeting, uh, or the latest meeting was held in August. Uh, the next meeting is October 16th at the Burke uh, County Public Library. That's 130 uh, Georgia-24 of Waynesboro, Georgia. The uh, WIP update. Uh, only U.S. underground nuclear waste repository doesn't have enough space for radioactivity tools. Clothing, debris, and tons of weapon-grade plutonium that the nation has agreed to eliminate as a part of the pact with Russia, federal auditors said. Uh, the U.S. Government uh, Accountability Officer found uh, the Department of Energy has no plans for securing regulatory approvals and expanding the waste isolation pilot plant in New Mexico before it reaches capacity in less than a decade. Uh, the Energy Department officials contend there is enough time to design and build additional storages uh, before the existing operation are significantly affected. A Senate committee requested the review of the auditors amid concerns about the rising costs and delays in the U.S. effort to dispose of 34 metric tons of its plutonium. Uh, the U.S. has not made a final decision on how to proceed. However, the Energy Department agrees with the auditors about the need to expand the disposal uh, space at the repository and devise guidance for the defense sites and federal laboratories to better estimate uh, how much radioactive waste must be sh shipped to Mexico as the U.S. cleans up uh, the Cold War era contamination. The waste isolation pilot plant, it was never supposed to be the only, the one and only uh, Don Hancock, a director at the Southwest Research uh, and Information Center in Albuquerque said. So it's past time to start the discussion of what other disposal sites we're going to have. Federal auditors say without developing a long-term plan, the Energy Department may be forced to slow or suspend waste shipments from sites across the U.S. and compromise cleanup deadlines negotiated with the state regulators. DOE is conducting the fifth, uh, DOE is conducting the 55 year re uh, remedy review for act <clears throat> the active uh, remedial actions implemented at the Savannah River site. The Comprehensive Evalu Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, CERCLA, requires that the remediation actions, uh, that the result in hazardous substances pollutants or contaminants remaining at the operable unit at levels unsuitable for unrestricted exposure be subject to a five-year remedy review. The purpose of this review is to determine whether the remedies remain, uh, protect, uh, remain protective of the environment, uh, the human health and environment uh, to, the, to evaluate the implementation and the performance of the selected remedies. The five-year remedy review will address 
three major questions. Are the remedies functioning as intended by the decision document? Are the exposures, exemptions, toxicity, data, cleanup levels, and remedial actions objectives used at the time of the remedy selected still valid? Has any other information emerged that could call into question the protectiveness of the remedy? Uh, the fifth phase submittal of the 55-year remedy review report will focus on the Savannah Riverside operable units with operating equipment i.e. ongoing activities of remediation, uh, a range of activities and a range of active remediation systems are used at the Savannah River site to address contamination contaminants in the soil and groundwater. For, for, for more information, uh, Janet Griffin, the Savannah River site, uh, River Nuclear Solutions, LLC, Savannah River site, 730, uh, 1B Aiken, South Carolina, 299-808. The Citizens Advisory Board uh, 2017 CAB goals. Be good stewards of the opportunity to serve on the Savannah River site CAB and learn about the site's activities and goals uh, from firsthand experts and sources. Uh, receive input from each CAB member, more public involvement, tours, and events, continue recommendations to DOE to express suggestions and ideas, new technologies always emerging, which can be a valuable, uh, which can be valuable to uh, the SRS CAB. The Citizens Advisory Board membership, uh, a responsibility. As a Citizens Advisory Board member, you mandate the mandate, the opportunity uh, to represent the interests and the views of the people in South Carolina and Georgia. Focus on your thinking and your views and how you can best carry out that role. Continually ask yourself, am I doing the best I can I can to represent my fellow citizens. Go out and tell the world that you are a CAB member. The CAB social, uh, do not forget, uh, there will be a CAB social uh, Tuesday evening. And when Ms. Nina gets here, she will speak a little more about that particular event. And now I'll be turning this over to Mr. James. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Thank you, Earl. So first things first, we're going to go through our meeting rules for the day and just make sure that we all understand where we are. I want to ask you all to help us adhere to the agenda timelines, and we'll just keep our discussions focused on what we're currently working on. I'm going to ask you to listen and respect other people's points of view. Every one of you do a really good job of that every time we meet, so I don't think it'll be a problem today. I'm going to ask you to participate and ask questions. It, there's no such thing as a dumb question, so if you're curious about anything, please raise your hand and let's... Let's let the group hear it and let's see what we can do. Please, when you do ask questions or make a statement or a comment, please state your name and affiliation when speaking. That's just to make sure that we have accurate minutes transcriptions. I'm going to ask you not to dominate or hold side conversations. Uh, again, those tend to find side conversations tend to find their way on the recordings. So make sure that you keep those to the minimum. Make your comments at a microphone so that everyone can hear them clearly. And I'm going to ask you to place your phones and pagers on silent, if you would, please. That way, we'll all make sure that we're all present and working here. Just to quickly go over today's agenda, next up we're going to do the agency updates. EPA isn't able to make an update today, but DOE and South Carolina DHEC will be able to cover a few topics for us. Then we'll go into committee chair updates. Everybody will update us on what you've been working on since we last met. And then we'll go into a couple of di draft discussions. We have a draft recommendation discussion on the German fuel topic. I think that'll be a great one. We've got a good chunk of time set aside for that. And then an ad hoc committee topic that we're going to discuss. We've got some time set aside for that today. Are there any questions about meeting rules or the agenda that we need to clear up before we go any further? Everybody's all set? All right. Mr. Craig, if you would, please. 
Okay, is this on? I think it is, yes. Uh, welcome everybody to Charleston. Uh, like, like every meeting, thank you for your service on the cab. We, we appreciate the time and the, uh, the level of involvement you have in helping us um, succeed in our mission. So we, we had, if you didn't know, we had a hurricane since the last meeting. So hopefully, uh, I know the site uh, weathered it pretty well. Hopefully everybody here did also. And um, so I got a few, few items to go through before I get into the operational update. A few items of interest. Uh, one, if you've been on site over the last, I would guess, two months, you'll notice we're, we're doing some major paving activity on site. One of the things that uh, we try to address as budget allows us to is infrastructure improvement. And this year we kicked off the, uh, the repaving of the uh, B Road from the New Ellington Gate all the way essentially through the site, about a 10-mile stretch of, of uh, roadway. We hope to complete that here in the next couple of weeks, and then our goal is to pick out a, one of the major roads on site and do an upgrade of those roads, uh, uh, one, one road a year. So that's all of our budget that we would allow at this time. Our uh, 2016 annual uh, site environmental report will be available uh, to the public online October 1st, and you'll get a update of, uh, of that report at the next CAB meeting in November. The Fall Environmental Justice Workshop on Teaching Radiation, Energy, and Technology, or TREAT, will be held October 4th to October 6th at Payne College in Augusta. The workshop targets Central Savannah River area community leaders. It includes presentations on the basics of radiation, as well as environmental monitoring and operations at SRS. With respect to the budget, uh, you may have read we're uh, under a continuing resolution with our budget for FY18 through December 8th. And what that means is we'll be operating at 2017 levels um, until a, a budget for 2018 is passed. Uh, just refresh your memory, our budget for 2017 was $80 million less than we requested. And uh, so um, we, we requested another $80 million in 18, so this is causing us once again to operate at less than our budget request. As far as 2019, we have submitted our budget request to OMB and it's uh, under their review right now. On program progress for nuclear materials, uh, H Canyon continues processing the target residue materials from Canada. The current work focuses on replacement of one dissolver and modifying the other dissolver to allow processing of high flux isotope reactor fuel in FY18. On plutonium downblend, K area completed all six of the required destructive examination of the plutonium 3013 canisters as part of the surveillance program for long term storage of plutonium in FY17. A total of 16 kilograms were downblended in 2017 and the cumulative total of downblended plutonium since 2013 is 67 kilograms. On our liquid waste program, uh, movement of Melter 3 into DWPF has com been completed. SRR is working to reassemble the Melter, and 89 of 90 components have been installed. Uh, once again, a refresher, we are replacing Melter 2, and we hope to have Melter 3 operational uh, by the end of December. On the SWPF project, uh, Aldich continues to prepare for initial tie-in um, of the tank farms and liquid waste system to SWPF. Uh, on the evaporator repair, we have fabricated a full-scale mock-up. Uh, it's, it's been complete and a demonstration is planned uh, later this month, uh, actually this week, I believe. This is a dimensionally exact evaporator cell, including a replica of the evaporator pot, which we hope uh, we can demonstrate uh, welding of a fix to that um, pot. For the, D DW or the SWPF project, based on July performance, commissioning is more than halfway completed. Forecast completion date is October 4th, 2018, and that's two and a half months ahead of schedule. 42 of 60 system operability tests have been completed along with one integrated system operability test. Simulant tank farm construction was completed on, on August 30th, and a simulant is what we use in the commissioning phase to test the system. Introduction of chemicals is expected in early November. On the tank closure cesium removal project, subcontractor Westinghouse has completed fabrication and assembly of the ion exchange columns and the process modular enclosure. 
Delivery is expected in late October, and the demonstration of that unit is, ex is planned for, I believe, May of 2018. On our salt stone disposal units, SDU-7, uh, we're, we're expecting to approve the long lead procurement items for that project uh, here this fall. In SDU-10, uh, we have a mission need. We have to go through a process to determine a mission need for that unit and all the remaining SDUs for the program, and that is at headquarters um, awaiting approval. On the regulatory activity, bulk waste removal act efforts in Tank 15 were completed in September ahead of the October 2017 FFA commitment. Heel removal activities have begun in the tank. DOE, South Carolina DHEC, and EPA continue discussions regarding the FFA high-level waste tank commitments. Uh, to resolve that uh, ongoing issue, DOE has offered more cleanup projects in D area, and we hope to reach agreement on that uh, soon. On soil and water, the DASH project work is complete in three of the four basins, and ash excavation and consolidation continues in the remaining basin. Completion goal for that project is January of 2019. The Savannah River National Lab hosted its largest, most diverse group of seminar interns this year. The 58 students from 26 colleges and universities in 12 U.S. states and territories, including Puerto Rico, did real work with the lab scientists, engineers, and technicians. I have uh, two issues just to talk about quickly. One is, uh, I think we talked uh, maybe shortly at the last meeting on the H Canyon exhaust duct or exhaust tunnel. In late uh, June of 2017, SRNS identified a potential issue with the structural stability of the H Canyon exhaust duct in the event of a hurricane, or I'm sorry, earthquake. Got hurricanes on my mind. Material processing operations were halted and are being analyzed for safety impacts. Target residue material receipts and lab sample returns were the first two material processing operations analyzed, and these have resumed after compens compens compensatory measures were implemented. Analysis on the continued processing of spent fuel uh, is to be submitted to DOE in late October by SRNS. Modeling for structural analysis will provide more information on the exhaust duct. And once again, this is, this is analyzing the uh, impacts of an earthquake on the duct and in operations of the facility. Uh, you may have heard the security force on site uh, uh, is on strike, and uh, United Professional Pro Force of Savannah River Local 125 Reunion remains on strike since August 15th. The contingency force, which includes people from Sentara SRS and from other DOE sites, continues to meet security requirements with no significant impact to site operations. Uh, last week, I asked for a joint assessment by headquarters and my staff of the contingency plan to ensure it was meeting all its requirements. I, I did, did receive a verbal out brief from that team last week. They identified no significant issues. and. Um, basically determine that this, the uh, contingency plan is meeting all requirements. Uh, we will be getting a written report on that uh, maybe next this week. And that's all I have for this month. Thank you. Bill Roten, CAB. Uh, thank you, Jack, for the update. Just a question. You noted that Westinghouse was the sub subcontractor on the cesium removal, um, how is their bankruptcy going to affect, if in any way, um, the ongoing aspects of that? It has not impacted it, and we, we asked that question as soon as it came up. There have been no impacts, and they're doing a, a great job thus far. They're a subcontract to uh, Savannah River Remediation, so they're not a direct prime to us. But once again, we're holding Savannah R River Remediation responsible for the subcontract, but uh, to date, there's been no issues. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Hoyle? David Hoyle, CAB. Uh, Jack, can you tell us if there were any environmental violations or noncompliances in the past couple months? We, we had one uh, noncompliance, and that had to do with a, uh, <clears throat> a uh, air inspection by South Carolina DHEC in Jul July. I don't know the details of it, but I know that the, the issue was resolved at the, shortly after the inspection, and there were no fines and penalties associated with that. 
the other issue we had was it's not exactly a, an NOV, but um, during the hurricane, uh, because of the, the large amount of precipitation, we exceeded the, some of our permit limits from the um, wastewater treatment system. Um, that's back under control now, and we'll, we will report that as part of our normal reporting to DHEC. Uh, we don't expect any issues out of that either. Thank you. Were there any uh, DOE order violations or non-compliances during that time? No, sir. And can you comment on the status of the double stacking project, please? Well, Jean Ridley is here. I'll let her uh, update this. I think we uh, we halted that earlier this year. We had we had uh, you know once again the the continuation of that double stack was planned in FY17. Uh, we did not get the $80 million we requested, so we did have to dial back some of the work in the liquid waste program. Uh, Gene, you want to update any impacts? For you, that you've got a glass waste storage building presentation coming up tomorrow, so yeah. a lot of those questions are going to get answered then. Okay, we can hold off on that then if you want. Go Gene ahead, Ridley, Gene. DOE, just another um, addition to what Jack said. The shielded canister transporter, which is used to double stack the cans is also being upgraded during this time. So we couldn't have made any additional can canister movie moves while that's being upgraded. Uh, right now they re uh, added a fire suppression system to it and some hydraulic protection. So we're at that waiting for those to complete. Okay, thank you. Um, also, can you comment on the status of uh, whip shipments? Uh, last we heard, I think there were Nine, eight out of nine shipments completed? Yes, we uh, completed the ninth shipment, our ninth and final shipment uh, this year. We are uh, kind of in negotiations with WIP right now about how many uh, shipments that Savannah River is going to be allocated next year. Uh, our plan is anyway to ship 12 to, 12 to 20 shipments next year, but we haven't got a def definitive schedule yet. Okay. Also, I read in the newspaper that there was a drone spotted on Savannah Riverside again on September 20th. Can you comment? Yeah, there was an alleged drone sighted. Uh, actually, there was a sighting of a potential drone. It turned out to be a, a non-event. It was actually our site helicopter, which somebody uh, spotted in the horizon. <laughs> and so it was, it was a non-event. Oh, my. <laughs> OK. Um, uh, I also read recently that uh, Western South Carolina, which includes the counties uh, occupied by Savannah Riverside, has uh, been proposed by the state as a designation as a capacity use area concerning groundwater withdrawals. Can you comment on what effect that might have on Savannah Riverside? Uh, I can't. I'm not aware of uh, the designation or any impacts it has on the site. Okay. And can you comment on the recompete status of uh, the various contracts at Savannah Riverside? Uh, they're still under consideration by the department. The liquid waste uh, contract, um, uh, for to refresh your memory, we had to extend the current liquid waste contract through the end of December, so that the current liquid waste contract runs through the end of December, and um, we are. Uh, I think on the verge of awarding the new liquid waste contract, although no specific time has been given. The m and contract uh, expires uh, July of next year. So we have a team identified to begin that procurement. First step will be uh, issuing a draft RFP. And uh, I'm not sure of the schedule yet, but I, I'm assuming that will happen shortly after the award of the liquid waste contract. Thank you. I have no more questions. Great. Thank you. We'll start with Don and then work our way down. Don Gillis, cab. Um, from the H Canyon uh, exhaust duct, that, that, that you said you're, you're still not processing, correct? We are processing the Canadian. You uh, are processing fuel, the Canadian, yes. so, that's, so that doesn't affect that processing. Right, okay. that's been approved, yes. Okay, I, um, I, I missed that connection there. Okay, on the PU downblend, you said there are 67 kilograms total so far downblended, correct? Can you tell me approximately how many whip containers that would be uh, that that's the not the non moxable if mox ever happens Greg of the six tons of I, I can get that information to you I don't know if top of my head. it's a significant number 
I, I know that we had roughly 200 drums of this material that we shipped to WIP prior to it shutting down. And so, and that was, you know, less than 67 kilograms. Right, right. So okay. I'll get you that number. Okay, thanks. That's it, thanks. Is that you? Doug Howard Cap. <clears throat> Sir, um, on the um, security force strike, um, do you have any idea how long that strike may last? I do not. They're, okay. as my understanding is they're not even in discussions at this point. So um, don't have a time frame on it. Now, are they being uh, the contingency force? Is that um, a skeleton force or is that man for man replacement or? So it's, it's not man for, it's not person for person. Um, so the contingency force is made up of uh, non-union, uh, non-guard union workforce from the site. Uh, we have qualified and trained uh, security guards from other sites. And now we also have guards from the current um, union who have cr come back to work. I believe there's about 59 of those individuals. So, so they have a plan. The plan is that they man um, critical functions and they work instead of a four shift operation, they're working two shifts. So essentially they're working 12 hours a day, six days a week, uh, essentially covering all the activities that the, the uh, existing guard force was covering with their four shift operation. Now, are they able to cover all, uh, I guess, uh, contingencies or just the yes, critical ones? No, they're, they're covering all required activities, uh, including the bar site, all site barricades and including the protection of material uh, across the site. Thank you. Susan? Susan, Cor Susan Corbett, CAB. So when we thought that Irma was going to go straight on toward us here, um, how um, concerned were you with, uh, how prepared are we to take a, I guess by the time it got to, into the land, it may be Category 5, but Category 4, but pretty high winds. I mean, how prepared are we here to withstand something? I mean, it was pretty scary there for a while. It is. We we have a uh, we we, went, we have a large emergency management organization on site that trains for these type of activities. Uh, luckily, most of our nuclear facilities that contain nuclear material are really not impacted by high winds. They're designed for uh, to to operate in, uh, nuclear operations, which are far far exceed a hurricane uh, uh, force. Really, our issues are trailers on site because we have a significant number of trailers and then basically down trees. If you've been on site, every road that we have is, tr is lined with trees. So we, uh, it's the transportation risk and it's the risk of people in trailers and, and those type of facilities. So, so under, under the hurricane uh, planning that we did, we uh, evacuated all trailers and we had teams set up to clear the roads as soon as we could. And, um, so we had a skeleton crew. We didn't have the full operations ongoing on site. Um, so we, we, we had, I wouldn't say significant impact. We had a lot of tree damage on site and a lot of road clearing. But other than that, we, we really didn't have any issues. So is there on site power being generated? I mean, do you have, you, would you be, if, if the grid was down or would there be backup generators employed? Is that, would we that have, kick in? And how many days would they operate before? Yeah, we have backup generators for all of our critical functions with uh, a large amount of diesel fuel on site as backup. We also um, generate a lot of our own power on site through our on site power system. And I believe, and that's, that's through the biomass facility that we have on site. And I believe they said they had 15 days worth of, of fuel, biomass fuel, um, in case we did have a power outage. So I think we were well prepared. Luckily, we didn't, didn't have any issues there. Yeah, thank you. Over here. Gil Alms with Cap. Thanks, Jack. I appreciate the update. Um, as far as the uh, fiscal year 2019 budget, um, have you heard anything from the OMB or any, any ideas of what to expect? Is we haven't, although I, I, I believe we have a, uh, a week from Thursday, we have their first meeting with OMB. They have our budget. They've, they've had some questions on it. And I, uh, we're participating in a meeting with them 
a week from Thursday. Okay, and I, I mean, I, I anticipate your answer, but it's, you can't share anything with us about the request at this point yet? I can't at this point, no. Yeah. Uh, okay, thanks. <laughs> it's a good request. <laughs> anything else for Mr. Craig? All right, going once, going twice. Shelly? Yes, thank you. It's a, a pleasure to be here with you all today in, in Charleston. So um, I'm with the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control, Sh Shelly Wilson, and I uh, just have a, a few updates for you. But you, you may have heard that um, our previous director, Catherine Heigl, left to go back to um, a private firm. And, um, and right now, David Wilson is the acting director and will continue until we um, have a, a new director on board for DHAC. So um, we've talked a little bit about the storm, Hurricane Irma, and I certainly hope that you all fared okay from the, the effects of the storm. So, um, of course, before any big storm or hurricane um, is, it looks like it might be headed to South Carolina, um, the state goes uh, into uh, emergency operation preparedness. And so, um, so days before, um, well before the storm, DHEC was part of that team, and you probably saw the, the governor's press conferences and all of the other state agencies um, involved. And, and really, you know, from days before to well after the storm, DHEC is one of the agencies that works around the clock at our state emergency operations center, um, really to help make sure everybody's as prepared and fares as well as possible. So we worked a lot with our health facilities that we regulate, and you probably heard about that, or, or dam owners to make sure that um, higher hazard dams were in the best position they could possibly be in. Did a lot of inspections proactively. But um, again, hate that the hurricane had any impact on, on anybody. Um, but ultimately, we were glad that it uh, had as minimal impact on South Carolina as it, as it did. So, and I keep uh, praying for no more hurricanes. So, um, and, and I'll just, uh, um, well, I also wanted to mention to you the, the groundwater capacity use areas that David Hoyle uh, brought up. And um, the state actually, as a whole, um, we, we have a, a uh, you know, a generous supply of groundwater as a whole. Um, there are parts of the state where groundwater is, um, it's a little more scarce, and so we keep our eyes on um, the coastal area mostly. Right now, it's, um, it's all up and down the coast um, because of various factors. The, the groundwater there is a little more scarce than in other parts of the state, and so we have um, uh, we've designated those as capacity use areas. And if any anybody, um, any industry wants to pull a, a lot of groundwater out of that er those capacity use areas, then they have to go through evaluation and, and um, a permit process from us uh, to see if that area can handle that amount of groundwater withdrawal. So um, we've had a lot of um, stakeholder involvement recently with the capacity use areas. And uh, you may have heard um, that, that we recently um, uh, approved a, a capacity use area uh, plan for the, the Trident area, um, really, you know, for how the groundwater is, um, that resource is preserved, um, but still, um, you know, some, some uses um, can continue and some new uses uh, for, for industry can come into play but it's, um, it's aimed at, at, at using the resource that we have, but preserving it for sustainability. And that's what those plans do. So recently a Trident area plan, that was for the coastal counties around Charleston in that chunk of the state. And, um, and, and we're uh, continuing to work uh, capacity use plans, um, or uh, actually groundwater management plans for the other capacity use areas up and down the coast. So like I said, a lot of stakeholder involvement. We've been really trying to get input from everyone. So we've had six stakeholder meetings and um, four public hearings so far. 
and um, uh, continuing in that effort. A as David mentioned, there is a, a new capacity use area that we're looking at right now, and, um, and that's called the, the Western Capacity Use Area because uh, we're finding that, hey, maybe we also need to look at um, Aiken, Allendale, Bamberg, Barnwell, Calhoun, Lexington, and Orangeburg counties. It's getting a little bit more scarce there, and so we're thinking we need to have a, a closer eye on that part of the state as well. So um, uh, if you're interested in that, that stakeholder involvement, let me know, and I can let you know what's coming up for, for those discussions. So, um, uh, and, and this is uh, really out of my my um, out of my realm, but uh, it's really more for Jack. I will say I've had some preliminary discussions with Savannah River Site, and the initial feedback I've gotten is that there wouldn't be an adverse impact from this new capacity use area on site operations. But again, I'm sure Savannah River can tell us uh, an update if if, um, if there's any concern there. So. Um, in relation to, to high-level waste, which is where we put a lot of focus on reducing that um, risk, uh, you, you, um, I mentioned to you before that last year we set um, an agreement with Savannah River Site to really get as much treatment of that high-level waste moving forward, and um, that that we um, that we have known that we would have to reset the tank closure milestones. And as Jack said, we're in discussions on um, resetting those tank closure milestones. And the discussions are going um, pretty well as of yet. That they'll, um, they'll keep going on for a while. So just um, you'll probably be hearing some updates from me um, because it, it's likely to take um, a good while moving forward to be able to set those new uh, tank milestones. And then, of course, we were very, um, uh, very, very pleased because last week we got in the application for the tank closure cesium removal project. And again, Jack mentioned that um, uh, that was a, um, a huge part of the agreement that we signed last year for new innovative additional treatment capacity um, for high level waste. And so um, that's just a, a, a very promising technology. And we were so pleased to get in that application last week because it's making progress towards additional treatment at the site. And, and that's all I have for you if there are any questions. Really? <laughs> Y'all don't have questions? Larry. Susan. Susan's going to say Susan, this Susan Corbett. Uh, remind us again why we have to revisit the milestones. I can't remember. I know I should, but I can't remember. Uh, sure. And that's a, that's a very good question. So um, it, in the summer and the fall of last year, we talked a lot about the salt waste um, processing facility, that big SWPF, the, the huge workhorse facility. Once it gets up and operating, it's really going to turn the corner in being able to work off a lot of that legacy waste. But um, some of our, well, one of our previous agreements had that um, actually, uh, it was some, our milestone was uh, 2015 for that facility to get started. So um, again, uh, you probably remember that there was a lot of talk about that facility um, uh, being, being delayed for various reasons, um, you know, for example, there was a, an, an upgrade of the design to a higher seismic capacity. So anyway, a lot of reasons for um, that, that delay. But we had to um, reset the startup date for that big facility, and we did that last year. And in that agreement, we got the commitment to, to really hardy major treatment moving forward to get that risk reduced. But even when we set that agreement last year, we knew that, that the, the tank closure milestones in our agreements at that time were not going to be met. And those were set back in, gosh, I think it was mid-2007 like 2007 or something in that time frame. So, so they were set way a good while ago when we thought things would be different at this point. And so it's just a, it's basically a reality check. Um, the SWPF is coming up later than we originally thought. Um, for lots of reasons, and so now, really, there's no way 
um, there's no way to overcome that delay except to, um, to reset the tank milestones. Does that yes. answer? Okay. Yes, thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Malik? My, I have two questions. First is, uh, uh, are you still monitoring uh, groundwater for contaminants in the Barnwell County and other counties closer, closely related to South uh, Savannah River site? Yes, sir, we do. I was just checking with my expert, but <laughs> yes, we do. And I think in March, I had asked a question, uh, if uh, the frequency of monitoring could be reduced based on graded approach, has that been given any thought? Uh, I don't think it's been given any um, current thought, but certainly if there's um, um, uh, some desire on the part of Savannah Riverside to do that, we could um, certainly go through that discussion. Do you know anything, Beth? The frequency? Um, we haven't discussed it as mm -hmm. so Okay. So, so if, oh, go ahead. If I, if I can help a little bit here. Michael Michelangelo's DOE. Um, with respect to the agency's groundwater monitoring, we are constantly looking at opportunities, not on a graded approach, but on whether we've got enough data to be able to demonstrate adequacy of the groundwater program. We have not asked the state to grade their oversight of our program or the, or the scale, scope of their independent <coughs> checks of it because we feel they're, it's, a, it's sized appropriately. So we, the agency doesn't have a desire for them to, to reduce that. I will say that, that the point of your question, historically, we have done that um, for areas that we regulate at the site. And certainly there are times when you've got a good bulk of historical data, you don't need as much moving forward. So we have reduced um, requirements for monitoring wells in some areas of the site historically. So, um, but, but it is a good idea every now and then to kind of uh, check and see, are we about right or do we need to... Um, uh, increase or decrease in some areas. Okay, my other question is about the tank closure, which you received the application. What minimum limits of contaminants you accept? How clean is clean? Mm -hmm. So, um, that, that, that is the age-old question, how clean is clean? So, um, we actually have some ranges for how much contamination can be left in the state for disposal, and that's in our saltstone disposal facility permit. So as long as all the treatment facilities can decontaminate, um, you know, to uh, enough so that the decontaminated solution still fits within those windows in our saltstone disposal facility permit, then, um, then, then, um, then everything checks out. So we we really set those windows in our disposal facility permit uh, to to ultimately minimize the amount of radioactivity that remains in South Carolina. Thank you, David Hall, Cap. Uh, Shelley, can you tell me if there's uh, any enforcement actions uh, either resolved or in the offing concerning Savannah Riverside? Mm -hmm. So um, the, the, the ones that I'm aware of have been resolved at this time. So I think Jack mentioned that they would be making some notification to us and, and, um, and that one um, we, we would have to work through. Thank you. Larry. Larry Powell, CAB. Shelley, you uh, mentioned the uh, reevaluation of the groundwater in Western South Carolina. What's the uh, purpose of that reevaluation? Is it that we are using more, and if that's the purpose, what's causing the additional use? Mm -hmm. a, a lot of things factor into that. It could be higher use. It could be drought conditions. So it's a, a lot of things that come into play, uh, a lot of different factors. But we, um, we, we do continually, um, I mean, we have a state monitoring system where we're looking at groundwater and um and its availability and we're just noticing that um you know for a variety of reasons um some of which we know and some of which we probably don't know <laughs> that, that that um area needs a little bit more protection from us so so it's that 
there is less groundwater available and that's what you're studying? It, it doesn't have anything to do with contamination or anything like that? Right, right. It's, it's, um, it's mostly about water quantity. Yes, but, but we're noti noticing that if we don't protect it a little, um, to take a closer look at how we protect it, that we might, um, we, we might suffer from unavailability in the future. So we want to avoid that and protect that resource. Thank you. All right, anybody else? Okay, we're moving a little fast. I think it feels a bit absurd to take a break only 45 minutes in, right? Does anybody feel bad about if we keep going? No heartburn? Yeah, let's move through. Let's start with Eleanor, and I think we can get at least through A&O and probably facilities, and I'll come back and I'll ask you if we need to take a break then. But Eleanor, if you'll take it off for us. Okay, I'm Eleanor Hobson, Chair of the Administrative and Outreach Committee. Welcome to Charleston, South Carolina. Our members of the committee are Kathy Patterson, Vice Chair, David Hoyle, Earl Shepard, Nina Spinelli, Ed Sturkin, Lewis Walters, Joyce Underwood, and Gil Allensworth. We will vote on the chair and vice chair in November. If you plan to run for either chair or vice chair, please notify the CAB support team by November 8th. Although our membership campaign has ended for the year, we are always seeking new members. Membership applications can be found on the table, at the registration table, and on our website at cab.srs.gov. The Spring Board Beat Magazine for CAB 2017 is available. There are copies on the handouts table. The CAB's outreach schedules are in your packet. Members of CAB, please watch your email for additional volunteer opportunities. And we are always looking for volunteers. We are looking for volunteers for the STEM Career Connections Fair at the Croc Center in Augusta on October 19th, 8 a.m. until noon. If you would like more information on the CAB, visit our website. The updates from our July committee meeting topics were voting on the chair and vice chair in November. We will have a ballot. And the CAB table talks calendar. We have filled it with volunteer CAB members for speakers. However, you may still volunteer in case someone cannot make the agenda then you can also help us. And those are all of our administrative and outreach committee remarks for today. Thank you, Eleanor. Does You're anyone welcome. have any questions for A&O? Okay, please take note that we will be voting on chair and vice chair in November. So if you would like to nominate yourself or someone else, don't feel like you have to wait until the 8th to let us know. Don't wait. Let us know now, and we can start collecting those names. All right. Any questions about that process, how we're going to do it? Okay. Don? Yes, sir. What happens after November 8th between then and the, uh, and the meeting? Uh, are the candidates announced to the cab? Yes. Yeah, okay. we can put that out. The, the real reason for a deadline more than anything else is just gives, gives us some time to print enough ballots and pack it all up for you guys and have it formatted properly, that's all. Otherwise, we could stretch that out later. But The reason I ask is um, when we revised our standard operating procedure the last time, we did include one of the revisions that enables uh, absentee ballot if that's necessary. And if, if that's to work, people need to know who the candidates are beforehand. 
Absolutely. You're right. Any other comments? I say, okay. Don? Don Gillis Cab. Um, I'm not as prepared. I don't have a list of members in front of me. They're usually up there. So um, we will be discussing the this uh, recommendation. We discussed it at the at the last committee meeting, and our uh, as a committee brought it forward for discussion and approval of the of the um, to close it out. So um, is this the time that we just dis discuss that? Okay, I thought that was just voting tomorrow, so we're, we're just we're just bringing it up right now. Okay, yeah. so we'll, we'll be bringing that one up. Um, okay, let's see. We'll have the presentation on uh, from DHEC on the uh, state oversight of cleanup tomorrow. I'm waiting to hear that. <laughs> so I didn't ask any questions in your in your uh, presentation this morning or this afternoon. Okay, um, and the next meeting is October 18th, 6.30 at our meeting center, Nakin. Please participate. Before we take a break, we gotta stretch this out. All right, how about this? Larry, why don't we turn to you? Why don't you tell us what happened in New Kermit last month? Thank you, James. Uh, Larry Powell, CAB. Um, first, I'd like to welcome everybody to Charleston. I, this is one of my favorite cities that I've ever been to, and uh, I think it's maybe the second or third year it's been voted uh, the, one of the friendliest cities in the world. Uh, it's one of the top destination cities in the world. It's just a cool city. And if anybody gets a chance, I know it's kind of touristy to do, but taking those little carriage rides around town, it's a lot of fun, and you can learn a lot about Charleston. So if you get an opportunity to do that, that that's something for you to do. Um, most of what, a lot of what our committee's been doing recently is has to do with the uh, uh, German fuel, and, and we'll, I, I won't bring that up much today. I just want to let you know that we, we are planning on going over that tomorrow. Um, our open recommendations or um, number 438 having to do with H Canyon and number 430, uh, 349, interim storage of spent nuclear fuel and high-level high waste. Um, our next Nuclear Materials Committee meeting will be on Tuesday, October 17th, 6.30 to 8.20 at the DOE meeting at uh, Village Green Boulevard in Aiken. And that's all I have, James. Thank you. Hey. Bob, let's keep it going. Okay. Uh, Bob Dorcab, and uh, I, like Larry, also want to welcome everyone here, both public and cab members, to uh, Charleston, South Carolina, Marriott Courtyard Hotel, very nice setting, and uh, very convenient location as well to get on carriage rides and to walk around town and uh, either go shopping or go out for dinner. So it's, it's a great city, and I. I thank uh, DOE and, and the CAB support for arranging for this meeting with this location. I think it's a lot of fun. Okay. Uh, again, this is the Strategic and Legacy Management Committee. I am the chair, Bob Dorr, and um, we have committee members, although I don't have a slide to show me all the names here. But uh, let's talk about um, open recommendations and pending recommendations. We have recommendation 343, SRS strategic plan, recommendation 344, prescribed fires, recommendation 346, drone spotting over SRS, and recommendation 347, curation facility. Now, uh, at our last committee meeting, we, um, we discussed these recommendations, and uh, what we're doing is we're uh, after discussion by the committee, uh, the Strategic and Legacy Management Committee voted to uh, close recommendations um, 343 and 344. So what we'll do tomorrow is we will ask the board for any discussion in regarding closing those recommendations, 
and then we'll ask the board to agree with the committee and uh, vote yes or no on closing those recommendations. Now also uh, at our committee meeting on August 15th, uh, we had a point of contact status update by Zachary Todd. It's part of a previous recommendation where we got a, you know, we just get a, a, a state of the state of the state and SRS. Um, we also had a um, draft recommendation presented to us regarding the um, the pension. Well, the, the the title of the recommendation was SRS pension budget line item. And um, our committee had quite a bit of conversation in regards to the recommendation. The uh, recommendation manager was Gil Allensworth, and, and Gil did a, a nice job presenting it, and, a great, and he spent a great deal of time developing the background and research information. And then he had specific recommendations with, you know, for action uh, by DOE. Um, but the, in discussing this recommendation, both with the committee members and the public that were there, and, and DOE gave us a lot of feedback as well, I think we felt like um, it was time to take advantage of our standard operating procedures and, and uh, set up a special ad hoc committee. That was the, what, the, uh, what our committee wanted to do. So we have an ad hoc committee set up, and I think our agenda today uh, talks about the ad hoc committee. I'll just simply say that uh, as the chair of this uh, Strategic Legacy Management Committee, this issue uh, uh, came up. There will be an ad hoc committee, but it'll be, um, James, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's going to be part of the Strategic Legacy Management Committee's agenda in terms of the time and when no, the meetings I, are going to take place. I think place. that if you guys approve this, it'll be functioning as a standalone time limit based oh. committee. Okay. And so we'll talk about that at length this afternoon. We'll go over any questions that anyone has. Okay. Regard Packet. And um, the chair uh, that was being uh, recommended was Tom French. But now I understand from talking to Tom today that there may be some conflict of interest with Tom doing that. So, uh, you know, of course, Gil Allensworth was the recommendation manager on the recommendation, so he's the vice chair. So when we get to this agenda item, it's either Tom or Gil will. We'll cover all of our bases this afternoon, I promise. Okay. At the Very rate good. that which y'all are going, we're going to have plenty of time to do it, too. Very so. good. Okay. Um, it's okay. I am. I can keep talking. Next slide, please. Okay, great. We're having a meeting. October 18th, it's going to be at the um, DOE Meeting Center at 230 Village Green Boulevard, Suite 220, uh, from 4.30 p.m. to 6.20 p.m. So we ask both uh, the committee members, uh, rest of the cab members, and also the general public, all are welcome to come. And an agenda will be sent out by uh, cab support in the near, very near future. Also want to note that... Um, Tomorrow we have a presentation. Actually, we have two presentations tomorrow. We have, uh, um, I know John Lopez is here to give us a budget update. And then also we get an annual update uh, regarding the Savannah River Nuclear Lab. And that's going to be by Dr. Terry Mikowski right from the top. So uh, it's usually very interesting to hear what SRNL has to say. And I'm looking forward to that presentation. So with that, um, anybody have any questions for the, for the committee? Okay, that's my committee report. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe I forgot to ask, are there any questions for Don or Larry for FDSR nuclear materials? Nope. Okay. Gil, if you would go over what you did in the list management, please. <coughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. According to what James has said, I have to talk for 13 minutes, and I don't think I can pull it off. Um, okay. uh, nice welcome, to everyone, to uh, beautiful Charleston, South Carolina. Um, <laughs> repeating off in, uh, Larry and uh, Bob. Uh, and Larry, you stole my thunder. I have written on here 
America's friendliest city, which of course you told me about an hour before the meeting. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but you stole it uh, from yourself and from me. Uh, you know, our June committee meeting uh, update. Topics of discussions. Uh, basically, we discussed how uh, we are the friends to nuclear materials Seinfeld, as we are the people who prepare the meeting for everyone to come in and talk about nuclear materials <laughs> while, we are, while they're waiting for us to get through ours. Um, we, we, discussed, we, we discussed the presentations from uh, last full board meeting and felt that they were sufficient and not a need for a recommendation at this time. Um, so right now, uh, with the waste management, we have no open or pending um, recommendations. Um, however, we, uh, we are excited about tomorrow. Um, tomorrow we have two presentations. Uh, the first one from Richard Edwards of SRR about mercury in the liquid waste system. We are we are inter very interested in that. And then, obviously, we've already touched on it a little bit today during um, some questioning. Uh, but um, Roberto Gonzalez from DOE uh, will be giving us an update on the glass waste storage status. So we are um, looking forward to both of those um, both of those presentations tomorrow. Um, our next meeting, uh, next Waste Management Committee meeting, will be held Tuesday, October 17th uh, from 4.30 to 6.30 at the DOE Meeting Center at 230 Village Green Boulevard, Suite 230 in Aiken, South Carolina. Unfortunately, I will not be able to be in attendance, but we are looking forward to uh, Dan Comiskey uh, presiding over that committee meeting, and uh, you'll probably get much deeper in conversation because of Dan. <laughs> um, that is all we have uh, from this committee meeting, unless you want me to like start reading something and uh, you know <laughs> trying to make it last longer for you, James. No, I, I mean we can all talk about the don't. sunset carriage ride with Larry. But no. I'm not going to talk about it with Larry. I'll talk about it though. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's do this. Let's let's take a 10 minute break. Yes, Susan. I was just going to suggest that maybe during this, since we have time, somebody could talk about the social that's being planned, too. We could do that now so some of us could make plans for that. I don't so know. Tuesday night, for those who are staying for the National Lab tour on Wednesday, this is a completely cab-driven event that Nina wanted to update you about. Uh, but she would like for everybody to gather, if you can, Tuesday night. I believe she's tentatively picked out the Swamp Fox as a location for you all to go out and have dinner. But if anyone has a different idea... Please feel free to let Earl know, because he will relay it for us. What time? That's a really good question. The reason I'm asking that's, is... That's just a, such a super question. And See, I, I'm going and I home, so I would like to stay for that. Though, I, would, so I'm just I would like to say that, that being a, a cab-driven event, I haven't been privy to all the emails and everything else. I would guesstimate, let's say, 6.30. Okay. Does that time sound offensive to anyone? 6.30, okay? Let's just go ahead and tell Nina that we said 6.30. Awful late. Is that past your bedtime? 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock. <laughs> Dan? Uh, just a question. Uh, would we have any elaboration on the agenda for Wednesday? I've got a work conflict and trying to justify me staying. You so, mean any, any longer than that? So I noticed uh, we're working with uh, SCNG and actually had SRNL out at our facility because we're uh, putting up a microgrid on our facility. Oh, yeah. And I see that eGrid is part of... Um, the agenda so just wondering trying i'm trying to stay and are the logistics is that tour done at 10 10 30 it is yes and would we be able to have our own car at that facility yes, you will. okay cool thank you all right any other questions comments everyone have a good drive down all right let's take a 10 minute break right now when we come back we'll discuss german fuel and then go into ad hoc. So let's come back at uh, 2.20. Let's make it 2.20.
was a clear definition of scope, which is to go look at the at the pension, which frankly was requiring a lot more energy out of the SNL uh, committee. So breaking it out had some sense. So you you met that expectation. You defined some scope. It needed to have a a, a sunset date that the cab would periodically go off and look at because we're not creating a another active committee for the cab. You've got four, there's plenty, and plus the administrative one. That's plenty for this for this group to cover the scope of work. But for a breakout on the on the pension to go in and dig it in there, yeah, I think you know, we'd be interested in hearing what what the cab had to say regarding our pension. Not sure if you're gonna bring up something we're not already aware of, but if nothing else, you'll learn a little bit about what's going on with the pension, how we're dealing with it. And if you've got some insights that we haven't thought about who are in the trenches, we want to hear it. So we'll go with the ad hoc committee <clears throat> and we'll, and if you, if that's what you as the cab vote, that it's something you want to do. And then when this May 24th date comes up, if the committee feels it still needs to have just a little bit more before it brings a recommendation and convinces you, it will weigh, we the two DF, DDFOs will weigh in on it as well and you can give it a little bit more of an extension if they're pretty close to completing their work, but they just need a couple more months or another cycle. This committee will be essentially another committee, just like any other committee on the cab. It'll have its own chair, it'll have its own vice chair, it's gonna be noticed <clears throat> for the public, the public attends and participates just like the waste management, nuclear materials, or any other committee we have. The only difference is it's gonna, it's gonna terminate when, when this one particular scope of work happens to finish. So that was kind of our thought. We don't, we're not weighing in as the department one way or the other as to whether you should or should not do this. We're interested in hearing where you're gonna go with it. Did that answer your question, Larry, I hope? Yes. Anything else, folks? So Tom brought up, oh, go ahead, Doug. Uh, Doug Howard Cap. So this ad hoc committee, is it, um, is it to make the public more aware of the of the issues with the pension and the in the budget, um, or is it for us to to uh, to give input to um, maybe help along the way? Uh, so, your your main goal would really be to provide input to the department. That's that's what we're here for. Right. But a wonderful side effect of that is bringing things out into public attention. And so whether that's a stated goal or not, it's going to happen. And maybe Gil or Tom would like have a few words regarding that that they really want to address. Um, <clears throat> we certainly want the public to be aware of what's going on. Um, but we really want to provide input, very positive, as educated as we can be, input to the Department of Energy to give them a platform to look at you know, from a different perspective. It's, it's, it's so much more complicated when, when Gil and I started digging into this and started looking at all the requirements. It's really complicated. And, and, and I think Michael pointed out that we're not experts. So we need to get educated so we can give some positive recommendations. Like, you, I don't want to just say, oh, don't cut the pension, don't cut the program, do it all. You know, that's not a very positive recommendation. Gotcha. So, so we have to come back with something that's as well educated as we can make it. Anything else? Tom, you mentioned that there might be need to be a name change. Maybe budget ad hoc committee might be too broad because you're really focusing on one area of it, but I, I don't know. How does everyone feel about the, the ad hoc committee name? Not to be pedantic, but that can have a, 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 a shift on how you focus. Yes. James, uh, uh, one suggestion. I mean, it's 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 a budgetary issue. It's being driven by the pension. I mean, it's like to me, it's like budget priorities. You know, this ad is hoc, all right. Budget priorities, ad hoc committee. Yeah, I think that's, that's one suggestion. Budget good. priorities. How do you feel, Don? You really want to ask me that? No. I do. <laughs> Don Gillis, cab. Um, it, it, from, from what Larry said earlier, the, 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 the pension is, is priority, period. I think, it, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's mainly how we're, we're trying to figure out how the department is dealing with the pension issue and still get everything else done. 
it's not necessarily an overall budget issue, but it is, it's very, from what I see is this topic is very pension driven. And if we make it budget, then we're back to the I, IPL and all that kind of stuff. Right. So, Michael McLean's theory, without getting out ahead of what the committee might actually do or recommend, that was my understanding of what the committee was gonna look at was more given the pension issue, <clears throat> how is the department dealing with the impacts to the cleanup and the cleanup schedule, and what advice the CAB might have for the department as we wrestle with that issue? So I believe it was focused on that, that particular point, but until you decide you want an ad hoc committee and that ad hoc committee starts to wrap its brains around where you wanna go, that's one of the things they need to come back and talk to you as the, as the board, at least, at least by May. <laughs> <laughs> as to <clears throat> what, where you want to go and what kind of recommendation or dec recommendations. Heck, you may even decide you don't have a recommendation at all, in which case you've broken off a group to go look at it, decide whether there is something you can provide to us. Yeah. Gil? On, um, you know, pension driven, but when Tom and I sat down and talked about it, it it's, it's, you know, Tom, you, you live in Aiken, I live in Aiken. Um, but I'm, as you were talking, I was, make, I was thinking about um, the SRSCRO, Rick McLeod, when he was spoken, speaking to us to a couple full cabs meeting goes or last one, and he talks about the five counties. And if EM dollars are shrunk, that's a lot, that, that hurts us, that hurts our community. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it, I mean, it hurts our community on so many different ways. It hurts our community because we're not doing the environmental cleanup that we need to do. It hurts our community because those, those ec economic dollars aren't going into our community. Mm -hmm. the, um, the money's not being spent, and that's just a huge trickle down is what Rick showed us and just blew my mind. And then it, the pension is another side of it because if, I mean, who knows, I, I mean, we, you know, if the pension got cut, which no one's suggesting that will happen, no one is suggesting that will happen. But if that happened, I mean, you have people living on a fixed income of $1,300 a month that worked at DuPont in the 60s and retired. Um, it's either way, you know, we, we look at it, the environmental, you know, the EM, EM side, and we look at it, the pension, there's a, there's a balancing act here. So yeah, and I think, you know, as Tom and I talked, we got so, I mean, I, I can't speak for Tom. I got focused on the pension side, but my, it, just in the complication of this and really starting to look at it, it's bigger than the pension. I mean, the pension's a huge part. It's, it's a huge deal to, it's a huge deal to our area. I mean, so, I, you know, that's the reason I'm excited. I mean, at first I kind of was resistant to the ad hoc committee. I thought we could just do it through recommendations and um, man, Tom really opened my eyes. Boss. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Bob Dork Cap. Uh, I thought one of the things we were going to learn by having this ad hoc committee is the uh, experts that we were going to invite were some of the actuarial people, the people that uh, work with DOE to uh, develop what the financial commitment has to be from year to year on this pension plan. Uh, and those assumptions for um, financial commitment can change. You know, I'm not talking about people suddenly uh, dying off and not being, needing a pension. Uh, uh, financial things change. You know, if interest rates change, if the income that can be made by the pension plan changes, then the current year funding can change. And then, you know, if, if 2018 doesn't look good, but maybe 2019 or 2020, the out years look better, you know, then maybe you, you can find a way to just get by for a year or two. Maybe the issue isn't as big, but you have to um, you have to learn from that. You have you need these experts. Uh, we're trying to educate ourselves. We couldn't just do it through a recommendation. Gil, you know, again, Gil started it and raised the issue, and it is you know on a, uh, on the years going out here, uh, 2018, 19, and 20. It looks pretty grim in terms of financial commitment for a pension, a legacy pension. But um, maybe the actual, you know, we thought maybe the actuaries could uh, educate us and maybe th some of these assumptions would change or can change or maybe there's hope or maybe that maybe it gets worse. So, so I think having this thing as a bu uh, budget priority is, uh, 
seems to be the key issue, not just the pension itself. So, Tom, so, so let me go back to the title. I'm, I'm pretty simple-minded. Um, the, the, I think the title should be something like balancing the EM mission with the demands of the pension, because that's really what we want to do. And if we just say budget, it gets so big. You know, Michael pointed out that we can't just keep going on forever. We have to fo focus in on something. So by May 24th, we can say, there's our recommendation, we're done. But I think that kind of a title would give you the what we're really planning to do. Budget and Mission Priorities Committee? Well, no, the, the, the balancing the EM um, project That's scope really with acronym. the demands of the budget. <laughs> yeah, it, it'll be a terrible <laughs> acronym. I'm sure Gil can turn into a snappy acronym. But. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great one. I love that one. So it would be balancing the budget with the EM priorities? Balancing the pension. Ba balancing the pension with EM priorities. Okay. I hope somebody wrote that down. It will be. Okay. Yeah. Now, we've heard a lot of support for the committee, and we've heard a lot of support or explanations on what they would do. Is there anybody that just feels like this is an unnecessary avenue to go down? Okay. So, again, are we ready to vote on this tomorrow, we think? Anyone need more information, have any questions? <coughs> Bob, I saw you grabbing for the microphone. Let's vote tomorrow. Let's vote tomorrow. <laughs> Straight, simple, let's go. All right, any other follow-up with that? David, yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> David, well, cab. Uh, the cab operating procedures say for chairs of committees the cab will elect chairs of committees. Okay. So my suggestion is is that we propose this or, or vote on this proposal to establish the ad hoc committee mm -hmm. and then we have a separate vote on who the chair is. Okay. Are we, yes. So DOE and Michelin speaking. One, there's gonna be a problem with doing that though, David, and that's because We'll have to take a look at, depending upon the scope of where this ad hoc committee goes, there may be some conflict of interest issues that we'll have to look at. One way to still satisfy the SOPs and, <clears throat> um, and, and still give you the flexibility to move forward would be to, for the CAB to vote on an arrangement where you pick the names that are going to be on this. I think you've kept the number small because you want to keep it manageable. And then the CAB can vote to allow the ad hoc committee to select its own chair and vice chair yeah, as opposed to having a separate vote because someone that you vote in right now if the department reviews it and, and we determine that there are some conflict of interest issues that would require a name change we don't want to wait another two months for the full cab to get together Good so point. one way around it would be to for the cab to approve the flexibility for the committee the ad hoc committee to manage itself with respect to coming up with its own leadership and from what i've seen so far of what Tom and, and <clears throat> Gil have done, they seem to be working pretty well together. With what you just said, Michael, um, do we need, for, the, for tomorrow, do we need to remove Tom's name then from his chair? No, I don't. I, Mike McElhinney's TV, I don't think we need to review that. You can propose an initial, an initial leadership arrangement, and then if there are any changes with the understanding that the department's going to have to look at that to see if there is any issue that's significant enough to come in and have to change something, you could vote to allow yourselves the opportunity to, as, the, as the ad hoc committee to, to elect new leadership if something were to come up. That way you're, you're getting the board's approval, you're, already, you're getting their vote and approval on the process to allow the committee to elect its own leadership. I think you still satisfy the SOPs and gives you a way to move forward without getting wrapped around the axle. Okay. That's right. Uh, Doug Howard Cap. I don't get a pension from SRS or DOE and E, but I do get a pension. And uh, when we do uh, come up with a name for this ad hoc committee, um, I kind of think maybe from the public perspective, if we would look at putting pension, not one of the first words in it, but maybe you know, somewhere in it, but not being the first thing, because the public could look at us as being maybe selfish and thinking about ourselves if we do. 
Well, now you know I had a great acronym for this. Balancing pension with EM priorities gives me BPEMP. I mean, come on, we've got a great acronym. <laughs> <laughs> the BPEMP, B-E-M-P. It, it's, it, it flows off the tongue. Let's do it. <laughs> oh, good, you went there. That's, that's a much better place. Uh, Whatever you want to call it. <laughs> so if we, if we do that, if we get you guys to nominate some members for this committee, and then with the understanding that that committee is going to choose their own chair, does that feel okay? How do we want to nominate some members? Do you want to have the chairs after this meeting you know, nominate some folks, one person from each committee? What do you want to do? Don't everybody talk at once. I can't keep up. We had it, we had it written in, in there that um, six cab members, ad hoc committee chair, ad hoc committee vice chair, FDNSR committee member, and uh, da, da, da. So a member from each committee and then a chair and vice chair. Yeah, not including, consists of a maximum of 10 members, not including cab chair or vice chair, um, basically because the cab chair and the vice chair serve on every committee, it was my understanding. Right. So um, six cab members, ad hoc, the ad hoc committee chair, the ad hoc committee vice, facilities committee, nuclear materials, SNLM, waste management, and then four key outside people. Bob Dork, CAB. Um, we, are, we do have committee meetings scheduled for the month of October. Uh, do we want to wait until then to have that as part of a committee discussion to come up with the, the name of the person, or do you prefer to get it done today or tomorrow? You know, we have the time. Why don't we try and get it, see if we can get it done today, get it done tomorrow. That way we can get it approved. Because what you have written in there, that committee wants to get started by the end of October. It's going to be a really fun turnaround, but the committee wants to get started by the end of October and establish themselves and get started. So let's see what we can do to try and make that happen. Was it Michael? Right. Just to, Gil, just to clarify one thing on the, on the back page where you, I think you're reading from the ten, maximum of 10 members, the, the six CAB members will be the CAB members. Your paper talks about four outside experts being part of the, the committee. The, we're not going to go create four new board cab members no, no. as experts. They will be available. The, the committee can request outside presentations, information, just as though any other committee can, and we'll make those. We'll, we'll work with you to get your experts and the information that you need to be able to do that committee together. But they won't be part of the. They won't be committee members. They won't be able to vote. They won't be able to vote, and, and I don't even want to call them committee members. They'll be they'll be available for every committee meeting. If, you, if, if that's what you so choose, they can act and talk, just, they can sit at the table just like they're, they're a member, but I don't want to get, I want to make it very clear that there's only one way to, to become a CAB member, and that's to be nominated by the administrative committee and then get it approved through headquarters. It, it's very clear that I have to go that way, so I don't want, to, I don't want there to be any confusion about how, how somebody gets to be a CAB member. Dan? Um, just a clarification on the membership. <laughs> Um, we're kind of speaking slightly in circle if we let the committee pick the chairman where it says here that the ad hoc committee chair will pick the members. So you can't, oh. we can't, uh, so we've got some cleanup before we get off the subject. Yeah. So I would recommend that uh, either A, we select a committee chair today and, and then um, and make maybe it part a, of the proposal. an alternate. Okay. And maybe a second alternate, and surely three people wouldn't be disbarred from. If, if you give yourself a chair, if you pick yourself a chair, and the chair picks the, picks the, the you know, if you nominate the chair and the vice chair, and then they pick the committee, the department's not going to render any, there's going to be no conflict of interest in picking a membership. It's when the committee starts to define where it's going and what it's doing and what it's reviewing that we'll have to go look at that. So I think you're good <clears throat> if yeah. you approve the initial chair and the vice chair and allowing the committee to make, to approve any, to, to self-appoint any changes that are necessary to the leadership. I think you'll still work yourself around that and not have to change the paper. But Gil, there may be some cleanup that we've got to do on this paper before it comes up tomorrow. I, I'd like to make a motion to nominate Tom French to be the chairman of this committee. Well, you have a motion in a second. Any discussion? Well, we 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's go in places. You, you can't nominate, this is David Hoyle's chair, you can't nominate somebody to be a, a committee chair for a committee that does not exist yet. We haven't voted on the committee yet. How much do you want to wordsmith this? Do you want to wordsmith this some overnight? Try to iron out those issues so that we're not in this box. Maybe have each committee chair nominate somebody. We'll build it into this so that you can discuss it tomorrow and wreck it. So if I can get all the committee chairs to just hang back tonight, get Tom, Gil, well, you're anyway because I just got you. Uh, every committee chair will nominate somebody off of their committee to participate. Okay. And then from that group, we will have a list of members that will get attached to this proposal for tomorrow for you to vote on. And then when those members meet, one of the first things they'll do is elect a chair, empowered by the full board to do so. How does that sit? That's right. All right. Mike McLansky, we again. The proposal here says you're going to nominate one from each committee, plus you'll have a chair and a vice chair. Yeah. So we'll get Earl to nominate two people. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one way to go do this would be to, as you sit around here and discuss for the paper that you're voting on tomorrow. So go have your discussion. You don't have to take a vote on it, but you can, you can pull yourselves individually. I heard there was at least a nomination for, for a chair. And a, if there's other people who want to be considered, those names can go in. That could be something that you vote on tomorrow. But the paper that you, the, the committee that you agree upon, either you're going to, um, either you're going to have a, um, a proposal with a name in it already that you vote on, or you vote on the the committee and then you have a second nomination around the table where you nominate and vote on a, on a chair and a vice chair. Either way works, but y'all have to y'all have to figure figure this out today because if Gil's got to put the names in here, you need to have some discussion. If you're going to just vote on the concept and take a concept paper with with names that that would be voted on right afterwards after you do some however process, go figure it out today because that that tells Gil how much he's got to go do today. Yes, sir, Mr. Dan. Just a concern for members who might be willing to take on more, as in this ad hoc committee, but may not be local to where the meetings are. It will be fully functional with online and able to call in and do all that? Yes. We will. doesn't impact me, but I know others have much higher travel commitments than I do. Yes, we'll be able to support all that. Would it, sorry, would it also no, be a good idea just if anyone on the uh, cab would like to bow out and not be considered only because you may not be willing to make that extra commitment and we have our committee chairs going to throw hats in the ring shortly. Does anyone not want to serve? Don, Larry, Bill. <laughs> Anyone else so that does not so want to? Want. It's okay. We won't think less of you if you don't want to do this. This is just a topic that you don't want, and that's okay. All right. Anybody else? Let's also keep them. Well, no, that's irrelevant. So how do you want to do this? Do you want to proceed with a nomination of a group, or did you want to go the other way where we keep it generic? I, I really think it's a better idea if we go ahead and put a proposed group okay. and then let the let the full cab vote on that proposed group or have have comments to change. But I think if the okay. if the committee chairs all nominate people today and we agree on what that looks like, we should put it in the paper. Yep. Then everybody can see what we're talking about. <laughs> so do you want to <laughs> So do you want to have that nomination now? Do you want to go around the table, or do you want to, yeah? All right, so committee chairs, let's just go around. Don, who would you like to nominate? Joyce. 
Joyce, would you like to participate in this committee? Joyce would like to participate in this committee. Larry, who would you like to nominate? Sam Commissioner. Larry nominates Sam. Dan, are you interested in participating? Gil already asked. Yes. Gil's going to have to pick someone else. Bob, who would you like to have to participate? Strategic and Legacy Management Committee. Are there any volunteers from that committee who are interested in serving? I'll look at that. That's um, any volunteers from SNLM? If there are no volunteers, going once, going yeah, twice. I'll, I'll volunteer for this. <laughs> no, you're going to be the vice chair, I thought. Well, maybe not. It says here that uh, we're supposed to have 10 people. I six. Six. Well, six. 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 Six cabinet members. Four of those right. are. Right, you're gonna have a chair, a vice chair, and then one representative from each of the issues-based committees. Right. Correct. Okay. But maybe Gil doesn't want so to. Yeah. No, I mean, I I was gonna volunteer myself. Oh. Okay. Oh. But, clever. And, or, <laughs> see, at first I thought Gil was gonna be on the committee representing strategic and legacy, but you're talking about one from each issue-based committee and a v chair and vice chair. Mm -hmm. So that's six. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. okay. So. So it sounds like yeah. right, you need so more than. I'm so Bob is going to self nominate. Yes. That's good. Yep. And then waste management, who would you like to participate? Bobby Winner. Bobby would like to do it. So there's your four. There's your core four. Do we need to come up with two alternates? How are we going to do the, the back end of this so that you have enough space for a chair and a vice chair? Has Tom been nominated? Tom nominated? Or Larry's committee. So we need to, we need to, we need to, we need right now we have one, two, three, four people that have agreed. We need at least two more people on. Oh, you got a question, Tom? Yes, Jim. Why not appoint each an individual outside this meeting? We're almost there. We're almost there. We got, we got two. Yeah. So, do, so do you want to nominate at large at this point? Yes. How does that feel? So, do we have two volunteers? Do we have two volunteers who have not <laughs> been nominated? They would like to be considered. Oh, look! There we are. So there's our. Six. All right, so we'll add this after the meeting. We'll add this slate of members. We won't assign any roles. We'll let the put in, add some verbiage to this document that these six members, when they first meet, will select their own chair and vice chair. The board will have empowered them to do that with tomorrow's vote. Are there any questions and comments about where we are so far? No, you're going to stay behind. I'm going to do it. Okay. So is Tom. Since you guys are the draft managers for this, I'm going to ask you two to stay behind and help work out the wording for this, okay? You might be late for your sunset carriage ride. I'm sorry. But, but Larry and I were going to go do that. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. We'll get you there. Okay. Any other questions, comments, concerns about the ad hoc draft? We feel good about where we are? Yes? Okay. With that, the next thing we have on our agenda is public comment. <laughs> yes, Don. Uh, Don Gillis Cab. I just noticed that uh, Rob's not here from EPA. Does that mean something? It means he doesn't like you anymore. No, oh. um, no Rob isn't available to come today. Uh, EPA will have an, a, rep a representative tomorrow. Okay. But. All right, just back to my paranoia here. No, no, there's no paranoia <laughs> to be had there. Okay. Yes, Maxine. Said DOE, just one answer to a question you had during Jack's talking points. The number of drums that have been shipped to WIP under the PU downblend is 670. Okay. Shipped. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, are we ready to go to public comment now? No last minute question cards? Okay. <laughs> so if we have anyone that would like to give a public comment, now would be a great time to do so. Uh, we ask that you make sure that your comments are comments on what we've been discussing today or anything related to the CAB's business. 
that we'd like to hear your input. Just keep in mind this is not a time when questions are going to be answered. These are comments. So do we have any public comment for today? Yes, sir. There is. Chelsea, can you grab that list and see the public comment list? Normally we would have grabbed it a little bit earlier, but you guys are running so fast today. Even when we drag everything out, y'all are just... What happened to my slow cab? We got new procedures. <laughs> Y'all got a fishing on me. What happened? Has anybody signed up? Oh, yeah. All right. All right. I'm sorry, I can't read the last name, but Parrish, the first name? Okay, please. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Parrish Staples. I'm, uh, to introduce myself properly, I am a uh, retired DOE official. Uh, retired about a year and a half ago, and I want to say thanks to those that were expressing concern about the, uh, the hurricanes, because uh, I've uh, picked up a uh, teaching job educating the next generation down in the Virgin Islands, and uh, got blown out of there a few days ago, which uh, made me available to come in for this uh, uh, public meeting on uh, something that's near and dear to me. Uh, I was a, a former official on the, uh, the Department of Energy's Nuclear Threat Reduction Nonproliferation Programs, the Global Threat Reduction Initiative. In fact, I was the, uh, the director for the European and African Office of Threat Reduction. And as I said before, I'm now just a, a concerned private citizen on this topic and uh, paying attention to it a little bit and having the time available to come and uh, address you having seen some of your uh, papers. Uh, but I am very happy to be able to attend this uh, Citizens Advisory Board specifically with the intent of making a brief statement about the German spent nuclear fuel treatment and storage program. Uh, in reading the documents ahead of time and hearing some discussion, I will admit I'm uh, uh, both personally and uh, professionally surprised somewhat to understand uh, your position is to indicate opposition for this effective cooperative nuclear nonproliferation research and development program. Uh, research and development is a very important part of that statement. Uh, and that this program is uh, in such an early stage of development analysis, I feel it's very premature to make any decision while more important information is being determined by the department. But there are uh, three main important points that I want to restate again, uh, clearly and succinctly, hopefully. Uh, this project is at a stage of technology development analysis that can only answer questions and provide opportunity. Similar to uh, the CAB's indicated position that the department should properly update the EA and other program documents, you should allow that work to continue. But this initial work should proceed so that timely and properly informed decisions can be made at a future date when it is both appropriate and necessary. Two, uh, the technology being developed for this specific project could potentially be able to address other international nuclear threat reduction and nuclear nonproliferation issues facing the global community. I uh, just Googled before, there's a very large inventory of graphite-based fuel and or material in the, uh, the environment. I think uh, all of it is not similar to this type material, but there's uh, approximately uh, 228,000 tons in the, uh, the paper that I just Googled really quick in terms of talking about the global inventory of this material that needs a disposition path, such an appropriate disposition dismantlement of existing reactors uh, can take place. So the broader benefits of this project should be recognized and appreciated within your decision process. Uh, last, this program is being performed in cooperation with a very strong international partner who is fully supporting the work. At this early stage of development, there is little, if any, possible impact to local, regional, or global environments or concerns. It is simply a research and development project at this stage of time. Uh, the timing is prior to any future significant decision point about if and how to proceed. So there is no GovToGov -gov agreement that I am aware of that commits either of our countries to implement this program, regardless of the decision that is made today or tomorrow when you take your vote. So for these few reasons, I strongly believe that you should embrace this program that demonstrates positive international cooperation, has such broad positive outcomes for the globally recognized goal of nuclear threat reduction and nuclear nonproliferation. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Chuck Mesick.
Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Chuck Messick. I, I talked with the full board uh, the last time you guys met. Um, I'm a also retired Department of Energy, National Nuclear Security Administration uh, representative. I was a FAR research reactor, spent fuel exceptions program manager for um, about 18 years. And so I, I, I kind of feel I have some some expertise or knowledge or more detailed knowledge in some of the things that we've done so far. Uh, so I'd like to briefly t uh, say a few things and uh, on two topics, but the, the primary recommendation from my, uh, my talk very quickly here is, is to recommend not making a recommendation until the Department of Energy gets to the point of their needing to make a decision. There's several things going on, of course. The research is continuing, which the paper identifies or acknowledges that research is continuing, but it doesn't matter what the research gets to make a decision. So Department of Energy is not at that step yet. So my recommendation is to wait until there's time to make a recommendation on this. Um, with this also, I, I apologize for a little bit of show and tell, but, but um, uh, Adams for Peace is a, a pretty big portion of the concept here. And what I wanted to point out briefly is, I, in my knowledge for Adams for Peace program has to do with spent fuel that department that uh, the United States gave out to other countries and partly the reasons why. And the Adams for Peace program is pretty, pretty big and pretty important back at that time when Eisenhower put it out. So big that they actually printed stamps <laughs> because it was that important. They printed, or people printed envelopes to memorialize that day back in 1955. So there's a bunch of different types of things on, on these type of things that people went out to get stamped on that particular day to memorize this. But what I wanted to bring up here is the issue with the stamps that identifies some of the things I think that you're concerned with or your thoughts that go with it. And I apologize, I'm gonna read just pieces of it, but I still have some up here if you wanna read the whole thing, I, I'd be welcome to, uh, to share that with you. Um, of course, we know that President Eisenhower did this. He proposed, uh, proposed to curb the nuclear arms race. Of course, we know that. Uh, encouraging uh, international sharing of peaceful benefits of nuclear energy. President Eisenhower stated that he hoped to, and this is quoted on the stamp, hope to find a way by which the inventiveness of man shall be consecrated to his life. Then the... the the uh, uh, purpose of what, the, what happens after this is the Adams for Peace program set forth a basic formula by which all participating countries would share in the distribution of nuclear equipment, materials, in the training of nuclear scientists and technologies, and the exchange of research information. Um, passing on, the, the International Atomic Energy Agency was formed as part of, uh, as a result of the Adams for Peace program in 1957, and we know that's in, in Vienna, Austria. At home, at the time, at home, the emphasis meant that past two decades has been in nuclear energy for space explorations. Efforts by other countries, other countries have been concentrated in nuclear power to provide electricity in undeveloped countries, areas. Uh, my point of it here is it was intended in the very beginning. Not every research is going to research exactly the same thing in every country. Why do that? Of course not, you wouldn't do that. The point of it is, back in that time, we took off because we already had the equipment, of course. We have Savannah River site, and we have our, our uh, nuclear program. So we took on that, that responsibility. Germany took on another country, uh, n another, other research. Other countries did other things. Now. The other part of it, under the program that I worked under, that was brought up earlier during your discussion in, into the Foreign Research Director Spent Fuel Program, there's two programs before that. Uh, I forgot what the first one was called. The next one was called the Offsite Receipt Program. Some of you probably know that. That all ended when uh, we quit making HEU. The earlier programs, the reason that we had the specific types of material that we brought back in, in, into Savannah Riverside or into the United States was because we wanted the material. The material was, is irradiated in a research reactor. It's still highly enriched uranium, which we didn't have low enriched uranium at the, at the early days. We brought it back, we put it through our process, and we reused the HEU into our own weapons. That was why it was a benefit to us. If you had material that wasn't exactly that type of material we could put through the canyons, we didn't want it. We didn't want to pay for it. 
So we limited the type of, of highly rich uranium that we'd bring back to the U.S. to the materials that were beneficial to us. This particular program, uh, the German program, doesn't fall into that category. We weren't willing to pay to do, to do this uh, disposition of material unless we wanted it. We didn't want this material. So it was excluded from the programs from the beginning. That's why. When the, the Farm Research Reactor Spent Fuel uh, Program came along, of course, we quit making HEU. We, we still wanted to meet our commitments of, of exactly the same materials we had promised before, which is why that program continued exactly as it was before. That's what we're willing to pay for. We paid for low enriched uranium. That wasn't a proliferation concern. We paid for other materials. Now, also under the, Internet, under the Adams for Peace program, if we didn't have that program, where would Iran be today? We'd already be past where we are today. They would already have a program many, many years ago. We already know that countries like South Africa went off on their own to make, make nuclear weapons. They had materials for five, had, had, weapons, had five weapons and material for six, public information. Those countries, Venezuela, I actually uh, removed remove material from Venezuela. I'm glad we removed it back in the late 90s instead of having it there today. So those benefits, we have all benefited. Every country in the world has benefited from the Adams for Peace program. Now, so my recommendation, that's why I think you should wait until the Department of Energy decides they want to consider the program or not before you make a recommendation. Now, in general, on the paper, the paper, as I mentioned before, acknowledges that the research isn't done. Well, why don't we let the research get finished before we see what happens? I'd like to address the 2013 NNSA response for a, non, uh, a proliferation issue. As I mentioned before, uh, I was there. I was the program manager for my program at the time. Things have changed or may have changed since 2013. R there was no research on this, on this fuel before 2013. It all came after. Do we know what, ha what the research has produced since then? If it made a difference, would you think we'd know about it? Because it's classified. Do, I would think we'd want the Department of Energy to make a decision whether they want to consider it or not before we consider it in, in this group, and then go from there. Now, I'm probably running out of time. I, I wish I could address some of the points uh, during the discussion, and I'd be happy to, uh, to address that with questions or anything, anything like that later, uh, as you might, uh, might want. The, uh, the fact that you just claimed that the highly enriched uranium, which is fairly low radiation levels, someone asked about whether it can be held in your hand. No, it cannot be held in your hand. But is it really high radiation levels? Not as high as a lot of highly irradiated uh, uh, fuel at, at, that's out there today. Um, I mentioned the, the, about the classification. Um, if it's possible that something could be of a concern that the research is showing, would it, was it wise for, for the CAB to make a decision to oppose it without considering that, make, or opposing it before that's actually determined whether it's a real issue or not? Uh, so I, I'd recommend not, not basing the 2013 memo to say a, as a true basis for that. If it is, if it is a concern, should we or should we not wait? Uh, that all close. Thanks. Thank you, John. Next up, we have Suzanne Rhodes. Thank you all. Uh, I'm Suzanne Rhodes, representing the League of Women Voters of South Carolina. Our primary interest in South Carolina is getting the waste treated in those tanks. And uh, we're consistent on that. I've spoken to you before. I'll speak a little bit more in a minute. Our national priority is nonproliferation. And along that line, I guess uh, some of you would be unhappy to hear that when the state was kind of in a twit about the plutonium coming to Savannah River site, we were silent. Uh, we did speak to some of our leaders. We didn't want it. Cut. When it was much, I won't say what proportion, but some of it was in not secure places in this country, casually stored, no particular plan, no close oversight. We thought that was a good plan. 
Japan's a whole other story, and we've heard rumors about why that happened, and so we were silent on that. But um, we are definitely in favor of non-proliferation. However, uh, NSSA and DOE headquarters, I think, has been um, pretty flexible with their definition of non-proliferation. MOX was supposed to be non-proliferation. It was a jobs program. Um, the league before me, a woman named Mary Kelly, proposed that the MOX waste be solidified, mixed with other waste and solidified, which in fact is now what's doing. Uh, several buildings and hundreds of people behind us. Um, anyway, uh, you kind of get our big picture. We don't want any more to go in the tanks, and that normally means the kind of foreign waste that come here to be treated. Much foreign waste comes here and sits. One of my favorite senators asked somebody from headquarters that asked a, worked at a nuclear advisory council meeting about the condition of foreign waste at Savannah River Plant. Had they been treated? And the guy said no. There's some other things he didn't know, so <laughs> I won't say it was the gospel, but um, Maxie should have been there. <laughs> it would have been a much better meeting. But anyway, um, where I'm, what I'm pleased about is this uh, advanced manufacturing a collaboration that's here in South, in Savannah, in the Valley. Well, it's up to Clemson too, but I mean, they formed themselves about a year ago, got some money, it's a lot of people and uh, enough money to make everybody cheerful and have some ideas. My thought is with all the talents that here, that is here at Savannah Riverside and the people that wanna help you get moving, uh, that is a way to share the future uh, without becoming a nuclear waste state site, which a lot of these things do open the door. I believe if we don't have dependable partners like Canada and Germany, not that they don't have their terrorists and other problems, but uh, we do too. SRS has 300, I mean, it's a wonderful site in terms of barriers, uh, but we can't do everything and we surely don't want to be the reputation of the world's nuclear waste. So I thank you very much. Suzanne. Up next we have Jack and I'm sorry, I'm missing I, Edlo. Edlo. All right, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jack Edlo. I'm president of Edlo International Company. My father and I have been working at uh, and around the Savannah River since 1963. So we have a long time working at the site and with the site and for others. Uh, just in case any of you didn't get a chance to see them before, here is a graphite pebble. This is a pebble bed fuel. Uh, I'll pass it around if anybody still wants to see it. Uh, it's non-uranium bearing and unirradiated, so it's just graphite at this point. But that's the subject of the conversation on the graphite fuel. So let me tell you a few other things about this program. It is in the context of Atoms for Peace that the United States sent highly enriched uranium to Germany for this research program for the two reactors in question. But it's beyond that. It's not just that we sent it out and over the years we've already returned so many uh, from, 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 I guess, about 40 countries, we brought fuel back. In the context of President Obama's Nuclear Security Summit, which started in 2010, held in Washington, then in 2012 in Korea, 2014 in the Netherlands, and 2016 back in Washington, and I was honored to attend the correlated nuclear industry summit in all four of those occasions as well. In that context, 54 nations came together, led by the United States, and decided to bring back and account for as much HEU as possible around the world, including, under discussion, this German program. Now, there isn't a treaty signed on this, but in the context of HEU minimization, fuel is being picked up from all around the world and taken back to a variety of places, not just the United States. Russian origin fuel goes back to Russia, and just recently, some Chinese HEU was removed from Ghana and returned to China. So it's not just about all the fuel coming to the United States. It goes to other places as well, and we hope it all can go back to safer locations. Now, this particular program started because the Germans wanted to try to find a technique to deal with this material, how to process material into a way in which it could be stored in a better form. Not having all the capabilities themselves, they approached the U.S. <coughs> government, and an agreement was signed in which they would work together on a research project, which 
started some years ago, subsequent to the 2013 uh, letter. Now, at 2013, it was hard to remove the uranium from the graphite, but now the project is continuing at Savannah River with excellent results being done. And I can't talk too much about it except to say that techniques have been developed which are being studied through the EA process in which the document should be coming out, we think, relatively soon, along with perhaps a FONSI if they've come to that conclusion. And then one will understand more of this process as to how this material is being managed. Now, bear in mind, this is not your, your money being used. The Germans agreed to fund this completely in the context of working with Savannah River Plant to try to find, and work was done at ULIC, and work was done at Savannah River, and meetings were being held quarterly, and the tech technology was being developed. And I hope it's going to be something that's useful to both countries. Because in the end of the day, this is not wind scale type fuel. That's not, it's not like the Chicago block of graphite that uh, we first used at University of Chicago. It's not Chernobyl type fuel, it's pebble bed fuel. And there are other materials around in the United States, like the Fort St. Vrain fuel, which is stranded in Colorado and in Idaho, which we might have a disposition path for if this process works, we could manage our own. And there are other countries who might want to license this technology in order to manage their own process in the end of the day. So this is a really interesting joint project between the United States and Germany to find a solution to manage materials of concern to both countries, funded by the Germans, under terms and conditions that have been agreed to, to work for others between the department and the Germans, and could continue. Now, I could sit here and go through all your conclusions and, and, and give you my responses, but I don't want to do that, because that's your job to decide whether these are adequate or not. Uh, clearly, I would favor going ahead, and I would recommend to you to do that, but I don't really want to do that today. What I'm here today is to tell you that there's much more information that's there, which needs to come out. And I would really hate to see such a good group, and I, and I respect the gentleman's comments uh, as to his views on this and his, his concerns. I respect it, but I would hate for you to pass something today or tomorrow only within a couple of days to see another document comes out which completely undercuts the, the, the credibility of your organization. You need to remain credible to be the right kind of cab. I've served on government agencies, uh, government bodies like yours, and I recommend that you withhold until you see what, what goes on. So thank you all very much. I appreciate the time. Tom Clements, you want to wrap it up for us? Thanks, James. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Clements. I'm the director of Savannah Riverside Watch. Um, some of you have been around quite a long time will be aware that uh, via communication from Germany, I first presented this issue to the CAB back in 2013. And because the Department of Energy didn't raise this issue with you or the public, there were red flags about the proposal right off the bat. I mean, I think it was unfortunate that it was not DOE communicating to you. Um, and I, I haven't prepared a statement. I just wanted to, to raise several points here. This morning, uh, Savannah Riverside put out its list of National Environmental Policy Act documents. And as has been the case for over a year, on this one, a date for issuance of the final environmental assessment was not available at the time of this status report. So there is no final environmental assessment, as you know, and DOE has today aff affirmed that. Over the weekend, I contacted colleagues in Germany. Really nothing has changed over there. The material is still uh, primary, well, some of it's at one site, some of it's another. The material that's at the site where they want to get it removed immediately, it's still there. Uh, it's probably going to go to another storage site within Germany, but right now there is really no clamoring for it to come to the United States. As we know, there was a nuclear non-proliferation assessment and that memo, or at least a memo from 2013. And I hear uh, people saying, where's the new memo? There is no new memo, you know that. The people that support this, why didn't you get a new assessment done? NNSA wasn't interested in it. Now, we've heard about the reprocessing and other waste might come to Savannah River to be reprocessing, reprocessed. And the question I have asked, where is the nuclear non-proliferation assessment on the new reprocessing technique. 
which is where the real proliferation threat is with this program. I've done a lot of FOIA, a Freedom of Information Act request on this. EM told me they do not do such assessments, and the National Nuclear Security Administration did not do this because they have really not backed this program. The development of this reprocessing technique without the proliferation assessment, to me, is where the risk lies. And the second place where the risk lies rise, is importing a bunch of waste from Sort Fort St. Vrain or other places to Savannah Riverside with no disposition path. We've heard that admitted by the people that support the project. Um, also, we heard a discussion about public support. Where, uh, uh, for the recommendation, where is the support against the recommendation? I haven't heard it, except from a few people who, uh, a former CAB member at one of the meetings, a couple of CAB members, and some people who are either associated with DOE who want to transport the material. There is no public support to bring this material, or in my opinion, a lot of other nuclear waste to Savannah Riverside. Now, finally, on the research and development question and the money, one reason that the money is, is run out from Germany after an initial $10 million, in the middle of 2016, the Germans passed a high-level waste disposal law. They are going to dispose of their waste domestically. They basically closed off the avenues for export of this material from experimental reactors. They weren't research reactors. The discussion basically ended, and Germany's not been providing the R&D money. Now, we can say the R&D should go on, but there's no money coming from Germany. In my opinion, it's not going to come. So you can pass one way or the other. If, if Savannah River National Lab wants to continue the research, DOE should put up the money. But the Germans, in my opinion, are not going to put up the money. They had planned to dispose of this material before 2013 in Germany. I went to Germany twice, 2014, 2015. I met with federal officials, state officials, local officials. There was no lobbying to me that the United States should take this material. There was no presentation to me that it was a proliferation risk in Germany. Um, I basically think that uh, the fate of this material is, is going to, that it's going to stay in Germany. But I think it's important that you, you pass the recommendation, mostly because it reflects the public opinion that people are concerned about more waste coming into the site with no exit path. Now, those who support this proposal or continuation of the R&D, please tell us how the waste would be removed from the site. You've had all opportunity. You've had four years to tell us. And I've spoken to the cab many, many, many times about this. I've not once heard where the waste would go. In fact, some of it may be disposed of on site. And I think that's where the public is most concerned that it would never leave Savannah River site. You've had four years for the proliferation assessment. You've had four years to tell us how it was going to exit the site. And you've not done it. So to me, you fail the test on, on making the, the proposal or preventing but presenting a valid proposal. So I think you should go ahead and vote on this. The delay tactics have just continued and continued, and I think the, the public wants you to go ahead and vote, and I certainly have, because I've, I've mentioned it many times. I know some of you are new. I haven't met you, but I've been up here quite a bit. So uh, please vote on this. I appreciate it. And just very quickly, um, the issue of drones has come up. Now, uh, I uh, just got a Freedom of Information Act request about drones, and I'm not going to go into details, but I want to read a couple of things. I'd be glad to provide this to you, and another Freedom of Information Act request I just got on the German issue, which basically confirms there's no new uh, research money coming in. Let me just read you two of these reported drone uh, sightings, and there's 21 of them listed, most of them from last summer. Uh, all of them turned out to be negative. There's a plethora of varieties. I mean, it's amazing. And let me read you this couple, of, just a couple of them and end with a little comment. Um, August 23rd, UA, UAS, Unmanned Aerial System uh, Description, black, approximately 10 to 20 feet long with small jet engines. Here's another one, I'll just throw this in. Light blue, six to eight feet long, fixed wings. Another one from October, tan, approximately 10 feet long, light and another one, light blue, approximately 40 feet long. Here's another one, white, approximately six to eight feet long, no windows or markings. Now this is my favorite. White, oval or obscure shape, without wings and made no noise. 
I mean, there, to me, it seems like there's a bit of hysteria with this. The only, I requested photos. The only photo that was provided was possibly a, uh, a crop duster. There's no photos. The, the uh, on-site officials responded to all of these and talked to people. So I'm sorry, but you may remember the uh, clown scare of a year or two ago. <laughs> Clowns popped up all over the place in South Carolina. Um, and I read this, and it's, it's, something's not credible with this. And now we get another event. It was a non-event. So I would be pleased to provide this to you. Uh, I'll provide you my card. I'll email it to you. But I, I will, of course, re release it to any media that might be interested. But it's, it's worth an interesting read as we try to figure out what the whole drone uh, situation was. But thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Okay, are there any questions, comments, concerns before we wrap up for the day? You're ready to go. Maybe? No? Okay. All right. So let's come back tomorrow, 9 a.m. We got a big day, so let's be sure to be in our seats and ready to go at 9. Okay? Thank you, everyone.